Hey, Kevin here, Skylabs, bringing you another video. This is definitely going to be a fun one. Whether you're new or a veteran to this hobby, I'm gonna go over some do's and don'ts when you're talking to your technician because all of us have to go to a technician at some point. Our local tech back in the day, I'm sure heard every single one of these come out of my mouth. And being on the other side of things, I look back on it and I go, yeah, I shouldn't have said that. I do not want this to come off as customer bashing. That is not the case at all. We would not be doing this if our customers were rude or disrespectful or anything like that. These just happen enough that I thought it'd be good to make light of it. And I think I can help you avoid a bad relationship with your tech. That's all it is. So let's get into it. And before we jump into this, do make sure you stick around till the end of the video as I'm going to give you a really big tip on how to save money on your next repair. And I was definitely guilty of this one back in the day. When you go in to take a piece of equipment to repair, most likely they're going to give you a time frame and you just don't want to be nagging. You don't want to call a week later when you were quoted a couple months asking on the progress. I think some people think when they check it in, maybe techs do a preliminary test on it and start ordering parts. That's not the way it works, at least at our shops and any of the other shops that I talk to. So if the shop or the technician gave you a time frame, wait for that time frame before you start checking in on it. In vintage electronics, I really can't stress this enough, you have to be patient. Parts aren't available like they were before, and these techs are buried with work. So unfortunately, if you're looking for a quick repair, it's probably not gonna happen. And if a long wait is a problem, I always recommend to people, next time you're out and about at a garage sale, go by a thrift store, pick up an old 5-1 receiver. You can usually grab them for 40 bucks. That way, when you go to have some work done on your main piece of gear, you have something to listen to for maybe even a couple months, maybe longer. And that should help keep you from having to pick up the phone wondering, when you're gonna get a call from your technician. And this might be the worst one on the list. Please don't do this. And that is call a technician or a shop a year or two after you picked it up and say, you just tried it for the first time. It's been sitting on a shelf and it's not working. You know, that is really your fault. The first thing you need to do when you pick up a piece of electronics that's just been repaired is play it as soon as possible and play it for a while. You know, make sure it's good to go. Technicians are humans, they will make mistakes, but the whole, I haven't had time to try it, it's been sitting on a shelf for two years and I'm just getting around to it. Um, and this next one is kind of borderline. It's usually the delivery that makes this one come off bad and it's usually people that have high-end items and what happens is they'll call and they'll say i've got a macintosh 6100 you think your techs could handle that have they ever worked on a macintosh 6100 before you know and you you feel like okay i think what a lot of people don't realize is if a tech has the ability to read a schematic they can work on a macintosh and in, in all reality they don't realize that macintosh is actually easier to work on than a lot of other pieces of equipment. There's so much service history out there, you can still talk to Macintosh technicians and you can still get support from Macintosh. And instead just ask, you know, I've got a Macintosh MA6100, is this a piece of gear you guys service? That works great, that's an easy way to say it without being offensive. Usually with the more expensive pieces means more people have serviced them, there's better service literature out there for them, so um, it's kind of backwards. Usually it's the lesser known or the cheaper models that techs are going to struggle with, not the high-end stuff. The high-end stuff was built better, built to be repaired. And the next one is a big one. Don't leave the tech hanging. When they call you with an estimate for repair, don't take two weeks to get back to them. Make sure your voicemail is empty so they can leave a message. Most likely your piece of equipment is going to sit taken apart on their bench or on a shelf next to their bench waiting for you to approve it. And it just stalls the whole process if we can't get a hold of you to find out if you want to go ahead with the repair. This is one of the easiest ways to really kind of piss your tech off because the quicker you get back to them, the quicker they can move on to either 
the next piece of gear or get yours fixed. And they're gonna like seeing you when you walk in the door next time, knowing that they're not gonna have to wait around for a long time to get your approval or denial. And this is a tough one because it's not the customer's fault and it's not really the tech's fault. Just because a technician fixes one problem inside of your amplifier or receiver does not mean that amplifier or receiver is bulletproof for the next 20 years. There are so many things that can go wrong with a piece of 45 year old electronics. I actually keep a sign up here next to the counter to point this out to people that might say something like, so if I go ahead with the repair, it's gonna work great for a long time, right? And I say, okay, hold on, back up. And the sign I keep up by the front desk is for a Pioneer SX850, and it's just breaking down a couple numbers. You know, there are 289 resistors, there are 203 capacitors, there are 52 transistors, and 28 diodes in a Pioneer SX850. And the way I explain this is, you know, if, if we change out the power supply and filter caps, essentially we're changing out 12 capacitors. There's still 191 left that could fail. So if you take a piece of equipment to a technician, um, let's say you're having a problem with the phono board and they repair the phono board. It still has a lot of potential for an amplifier failure, uh, an AMFM failure, a tone board failure. Unfortunately, with vintage electronics, this is one of the risks and that is you know, you could have several repairs over the next 10 years. There isn't a $400 fix everything service out there. It's just not possible. And this is a tough one too, because I think people's memories sometimes get the best of them. I've had people come in and they'll say, you know, I got my amplifier receiver fixed. There's still something wrong. It just doesn't sound like it used to. And they'll use, you know, descriptors like, you know, the the mid-range isn't the same, or it's not as warm as it used to be, or it's almost kind of like guitars. 1959, uh, you know, it just, you can, uh, listen. How much is Just this? listen for a minute. I'm the not, sustain, listen to it. I'm not hearing anything. You would, though, if it were playing. If you're getting in the guitar or bass amplifier repair game, get ready for the insanity. Because when guitarists and bassists start describing how the sound isn't brown anymore or it's not as orange as it used to be, um, as a technician, there is no equation for brown and orange equals this voltage. It doesn't work that way. And it's kind of the same thing with vintage electronics, especially amplifiers and receivers. You know, technicians are looking at voltages. They're making sure things are correct. And it doesn't translate into how does this sound? It translates into, is this working as intended? And that's the technician's goal. They're not trying to change the sound. They're trying to get it back to spec. I've had people say, it doesn't sound like it used to, and I will follow it up with a question of, well, when was the last time you heard it? It's been about 10 or 15 years since we were in our last home when it was hooked up. And immediately, you know, you know where this is going. They're in a different room. They might have different speakers. Their age and their hearing is probably playing a factor into this. And that makes that one a really difficult one to navigate. So try not to go up your memory on how something sounded and try and explaining that to a tech that is just trying to get your amplifier healthy. Uh, it's, it's just gonna be kind of a losing battle, I hate to say it. And this last one kind of goes into my tip on how to save money on your next repair. And that is when you bring your piece of equipment in, don't just say it doesn't work because it's gonna take that technician a lot more time in order to troubleshoot the problem we did a video a while ago on how to troubleshoot your vintage electronics. I definitely recommend going and watching that video because there are some very simple things you can do to narrow down the issue. And the more details you can give them, the better. You know, is it just on the phono input? Is it just FM? If channels are dropping out when you wiggle the knobs, are they coming back on? There's just a lot of good tips in that video. So I definitely recommend that to make sure the next time you take a piece of equipment in, you're saving yourself some money by doing just a little bit of troubleshooting before you come in. And by no means am I implying that technicians are delicate little flowers or you need to kiss their ass or anything like that. I just think because we hear so many of these so often and that I'm guilty of them myself 
at least when I was younger or just getting into the hobby that these are just good things to know. To me, they're kind of like a mechanic because I am so inept when it comes to car repair. I have to trust my mechanic because I don't speak auto mechanic. These technicians, um, they might not have the best bedside manner. Most technicians aren't the most social people you'll ever meet. Most of them want to just be left alone in their in their dark room and they want to play with their electronics. I kind of look at them like nurses, but instead of working on humans, they like helping electronics. And also remember your technician is going to make mistakes. They're human. It's going to happen. With social media and word of mouth, a bad technician isn't going to be around very long. A good technician admits when they're wrong, they fix the problem, and they get it back to you. But you also have to trust that if a tech says, you know, this isn't part of the problem I fixed, you have to trust them that you have another issue. It goes both ways. Just don't forget, they're going to make a mistake. And as long as they take care of it, if it is something on them, I don't think you can ask for anything more. At least I can't. And I just want to let you all know, we did start a newsletter. I know seven years we've been in business and we're just starting a newsletter. Definitely head over to skylabsaudio.com. Join that newsletter. We're going to be putting out at least once a month. I thank you for watching another video and we'll see you in the next one. Thank you.